Thank you. And I call Colin McGrath, Chairperson of the Ex Executive Office Committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I rise today to speak on behalf of the Committee of the Executive Office on what is an important uh, issue for every strand of our society. Uh, for the most part, it is crying out for much greater powers and restrictions to help in the fight against COVID-19. Can I begin by offering my condolences to the families of those that have died as a result of the coronavirus in the North? We have had our third death, and we know that this is sadly only the beginning. The scrutiny by Assembly Committees of Legislative Consent Memorandums is usually full and intense. Under normal circumstances, members would have the benefit of a committee report on the Legislative Consent Memorandum to help inform deliberations on whether to grant the Legislative Consent. But with such urgent legislation, this has not been possible. There is no doubt that a significant challenge faces us all in fulfilling our scrutiny role in the COVID-19 crisis setting. Everything is urgent. Everything is fast moving. Things are changing by the hour. The Committee of the Executive Office has carried out some scrutiny of the provisions of the Bill that fall under the responsibility of the Executive Office. It received written briefings from officials on Friday past, and the lead official helpfully offered to speak to members if they needed any clarification in advance of this debate. As has already been outlined, the Executive Office has policy responsibility for civil contingencies. Therefore, Clause 50 and Schedules 21, Part 5 of the Bill give the Department powers in relation to events, gatherings and premises in Northern Ireland. I understand that they will complement the powers to be made available to the Department of Health on the control of infectious diseases and are similar in effect to other provisions in the Bill covering other jurisdictions. The powers will be available for use immediately on commencement, although it is hoped that the voluntary postponement of mass gatherings in response to the outbreak means early use is unlikely. We have already seen many organisations take that life-saving step of postponing events, and they should be applauded for this. The Executive Office will have the power to make and subsequently revoke declarations indicating that the incidence of or transmission of coronavirus constitutes a serious and imminent threat to public health. Where such a declaration is made, the Executive, uh, Executive Office has the power to prohibit or restrict events or gatherings and close premises or impose restrictions on persons entering or remaining inside them. Anyone who fails to comply with the direction will be guilty of an offence punishable by a fine of up to £100,000 on summary conviction or an unlimited fine on conviction or indictment. I sincerely hope that we do not get to that stage. There is a duty on every citizen to comply with directions that aim to protect society during these unprecedented times. I mentioned earlier that a significant challenge faces us all in fulfilling our scrutiny role on COVID-19 crisis setting. In this context, safeguards become even more important to ensure that powers are being properly and proportionately used. So in terms of safeguards, the powers are exercisable only if a declaration of threat to public health has been made by the Executive Office on advice of the Chief Medical Officer or any of his deputies. And the direction is given for purposes of preventing, protecting against or controlling the incidence or transmission of coronavirus or facilitating the most appropriate deployment of medical or emergency personnel and resources in Northern Ireland. What that means is the advice of the Chief Medical Officer or his deputies must be sought before a direction is made. This would appear to be a significant safeguard. Mr Speaker, I now speak to you as a member of the Health Committee and as an MLA for South Down. Much has been said over the last months about this Assembly that it would define us and our collective capacity to, and resolve to work together. This moment and this day can be the defining defining moment of this assembly. There is no other single issue, not one in a generation, which has brought people together, removed the stain of orange and green politics and seen the need for us all to work together as this issue has. So we are brought to the coronavirus bill which has brought to this House today for consideration. We are told that to effectively respond to this ongoing pandemic, consistency of outcome will be achieved by making the range of tools and powers consistent across the UK. 
Mr Speaker, I fully appreciate that this is not an easy ask for any of us. The legislation is not perfect and it is not legislation I ever believed that I would be asked to support. But these are extraordinary times. The legislation before us will be time limited for two years and it is neither necessary nor appropriate for all of the measures to come into force immediately or at all. We have the ability with scientific evidence to bring these powers mm -hmm. to an early close. And I welcome that there are moves in London to have this reviewed every six months, and I feel that that would be appropriate. In some of the clauses, Mr. Speaker, the emergency registration of healthcare professionals. Uh, all over the North at present, we see doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals graduating early or re registering so that they can put themselves at the very front line of this pandemic. Let us never forget the debt of gratitude that we owe to them, and I hope that any concerns that they have regarding their pension payments can be quickly resolved. Pharmacists are another set of unsung heroes. They will have emergency provision to prescribe medicines and drugs they would otherwise not have been able to do. We extend our thanks to pharmacists too, who are at the front line of this battle. Other staff and other professions will be able to take blocks of leave up to four weeks at a time as part of emergency volunteering, uh, and that will be enabling them to help, against the, or to help with this fight against COVID-19. This is critical because the work may very well overwhelm our National Health Service staff, and they will need our help, our assistance, and we should welcome this provision to allow people to step up to the mark. In terms of PPE, we have many in our health sector who are concerned for their safety. They are at the front line, exposed to this virus day and daily. They need protected and protected properly. We owe it to them for their endeavours to protect them and provide them with the personal protective equipment is a must. But then also, as been mentioned, what of our retail sector uh, and other sectors? They are at the front line, engaging day and daily with people that potentially have this virus and we should consider providing some help or some assistance for them. Uh, in terms of, um, it, except, Mr. Speaker, that there may need to be some reconfiguration of health services uh, within our health network, and I wouldn't question that, but I want an assurance from you, Minister, that any such moves will be temporary, uh, and can I seek from you today on the record that any reconfiguration of health services is temporary and will be moved back again once this passes. In terms of, speaking, uh, or ten, terms of testing, Mr. Speaker, um, this bill is not perfect. There are glaring omissions. I mean, why are we not uh, testing more? I welcome that the Minister made a reference earlier to an increase in testing because we need to ramp up our capability and see an immediate programme put in place within our communities that lets anybody that is worried uh, be tested uh, and then have the results quickly. It is silly to have medical and healthcare staff off sick for 14 days when a simple test with results in 48 hours could let them back onto the wards 11 days earlier. And what of the other essential staff that we are making work? Today, there are teachers in schools looking after children whose parents are day and daily in contact with people suffering from the virus. Can they be tested too? The potential for cross-contamination in such a setting is massive. This bill also gives the Department of Education, and by extension the Minister, the power to direct schools to close temporarily. Unfortunately, it must be said that up to this point, the lack of and confusing information provided to the, by the Department has been unhelpful. My inbox, and I'm sure that of many other members, has been filled with concerned teachers, parents and unions worried about what to do, what not to do, and then how to do it. I hope the Minister of Education will ensure that there is greater clarity, though judging by his tweet last night, I won't hold out too much hope for that clarity. Um, the bill now also brings into force provisions for power in relation to the funding of additional employers' liabilities for SSP incurred as a result of the COVID-19 outbreak. Businesses are struggling out there, and the news of recent interventions has been helpful. SSP is a concern because most businesses will have people off sick at some stage, and there could be a drain on their financial resources of their business, especially small and medium ones. 
I also hope that the rumours that there will be some help and assistance for the self-employed uh, will come to you as well. And I understand that there may be some announcements in London this morning, uh, and hopefully that will provide some help for our self-employed sector who have been waiting for information. There are worrying times, and, and the self-employed do feel a little bit like a forgotten clan, and they've been left to watch their employers get 80% of their wages whilst they face universal credit. As I've said, powers will be given to the public health officers to require potentially infectious persons to go to suitable places to undergo screening and assessment, to remain in isolation, and to place restrictions on their travel activities and contact with other people. The Executive Office will be enabled to restrict or prohibit gatherings or events, to close and restrict access to premises during a public health response period. Now, ordinarily, I, I would argue that it is not the task of this Assembly to prohibit activity. Our task should be to enable people as fully as possible. But as I've said, these are extraordinary times. The Prime Minister has said uh, two people or a family unit of living together is constituting a mass gathering. But what is the penalty and how will it be enforced? Will it be the police or will there be other officers? What happens if there's non-payment? By prohibiting gathering or events, I believe we enable more people to survive this crisis. All across the North, we have seen a small section of people disregarding the expert medical advice up to now. They have directly led to the need for the near lockdown scenario that we are currently in. They have not been able to follow simple directions and now have had to be given direct orders. I hope that this will have the effect that is required to stem the spread. And I would add, Mr Speaker, that the vast majority of social media last night was welcoming of these new rules and guidelines, but some were already suggesting ways around it. And I worry that on my travel to here today, I saw that the traffic was lighter, but I don't think that it was substantially reduced. So there are still many people moving around our community and that does make me worried. I also saw somewhat more people walking to the shop this morning on my journey up than I ordinarily would. And again, I think people are taking the advice to go out, but I hope that they're not going to be going back and forward to the shop all day. We need people to heed the advice. In terms of work and who shouldn't go and who should go, Mr Speaker, I think confusion reigns. What did the Prime Minister mean when he said only essential work in a speech? but then the guideline said only work that can be done that cannot be done from home. These are difficult times for people and there is much confusion and people such as Boris Johnson need to know that his words will have a massive impact upon families, communities and economies and he needs to choose them very carefully. We need to see urgent clarity on those that can and cannot go to work as this is causing serious stress for people who are genuinely afraid that they will be breaking the rules. Many people have contacted me over the past few days too from far-flung places who are facing lockdown in other countries. I have had people contact me from Australia, Thailand, America and Peru. People are frightened that they may not get home if airports and flights are cancelled. And many young people who are on gap years and the like are working from bar to bar or hotel to hotel to subsidise their travel well, that work is completely drying up in other countries. And then with cancelled flights and borders being shut down, they are facing a short-term future that has no income, no shelter and no way out. And we must link as an executive, and I would ask the executive to link with authorities in Dublin and London to do what we can to help people who are facing that peril. Mr Speaker, in conclusion, we have some truly difficult days ahead. Difficult days for this Assembly, for our health and education services, for our businesses, for all the people of the North. But without revisiting the past too much, we have overcome some truly difficult days already. This virus will pass. When it does, when we step out of our homes and back into our meeting places and social circles, when we walk to the gym or our favourite coffee shop again, and when we reach out and shake the hand of a stranger or hug our loved ones close to us again, we will see just what each of us did to bring the dark days to a close. I support and call on the support of all here present for this bill. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Steve Aiken. Uh, Mr Speaker, I rise as leader of the Ulster Unionist Party to support...